TCP is a reliable layer four protocol. TCP uses a three-way handshake to create reliable connections across the network. TCP can reorder segments that arrive out of order and retransmit missing segments. UDP is a simpler and faster cousin to TCP. UDP is commonly used for applications that are lossy or can handle some packet loss, such as streaming audio and video. It is also used for query response applications, such as DNS queries. SecureShell, or SSH, was designed as a secure replacement for Telnet, FTP, and the Unix R commands. It provides confidentiality, integrity, and secure authentication, among other features. SSH includes SFTP and SCP for transferring files. SSH can also be used to securely tunnel other protocols, such as HTTP. SSH servers listen on TCP port 22 by default. FTP is the file transfer protocol used to transfer files to and from servers. Like Telnet, FTP has no confidentiality or integrity and should not be used to transfer sensitive data over insecure channels. FTP uses two ports. The control connection, where commands are sent, is TCP port 21. Active FTP uses a data connection, where data is transferred that originates from TCP port 20. DNS is the domain name system, a distributed global database that translates names to IP addresses and vice versa. DNS uses both TCP and UDP. Small responses use UDP port 53, while large responses, including zone transfers, use TCP port 53. The TCP IP model is a popular network model created by DARPA in the 1970s. TCP IP is an informal name named after the first two protocols created. The formal name is the Internet Protocol Suite. The TCP IP model is simpler than the OSI model. While TCP and IP receive top billing, TCP IP is actually a suite of protocols including UDP and ICMP, among many others. The internet layer of the TCP IP model aligns with layer three or the network layer of the OSI model. This is where IP addresses and routing live. When data is transmitted from a node to one LAN to a node on a different LAN, the internet layer is used. IP version 4, IP version 6, ICMP, and routing protocols, among others, are internet layer TCP IP protocols. IP version 6 is the successor to IP version 4, featuring far larger address space, simpler routing, and simpler address assignment. A lack of IP version 4 addresses was the primary factor that led to the creation of IP version 6. The most modern systems now are dual stack and use both IP version 4 and IP version 6 simultaneously. Hosts may also access IP version 6 networks via IP version 4. This is called tunneling. Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, is a helper protocol that assists layer 3. ICMP is used to troubleshoot and report error conditions. Without ICMP to help, IP would fail when faced with routing loops, ports, hosts, or networks that are down. ICMP has no concept of ports as TCP and UDP do, but instead uses types and codes. Telnet provides terminal emulation over a network. Terminal means text-based VT100 style terminal access. Telnet servers listen on TCP port 23. Telnet was the standard way to access an interactive command shell over a network for over 20 years. Telnet is weak because it provides no confidentiality. All data transmitted during a Telnet session is plain text, including the username and password used to authenticate the system. The network access layer of the TCP IP model combines layer one and layer two of the OSI model. It describes layer one issues such as energy bits and the medium used to carry them, copper fire, wireless, etc. It also describes layer two issues like converting bits into protocol units such as Ethernet frames, MAC addresses, and network interface cards. IPv4 is Internet Protocol version 4, commonly called just IP. It is a simple protocol designed to carry data across networks. It is so simple that it requires a helper protocol called ICMP. IP is connectionless and unreliable. It provides best effort delivery of packets. If connections or reliability are required, they must be provided by a higher level protocol carried by IP such as TCP.
IP version 4 uses 32-bit source and destination addresses usually shown in dotted quad format, such as 192.168.2.4. A 32-bit address field allows 2 to the 32nd, or nearly 4.3 billion addresses. TCP connects from a source port to a destination port, such as from source port 51178 to destination port 22. The TCP port field is 16 bits, allowing port numbers from 0 to 65535. There are two types of ports, reserved and ephemeral. A reserved port is 1023 or lower. Ephemeral ports are from 1024 to 65535. Most operating systems require super user privileges to be able to open a reserved port. Any user may open an unused ephemeral port. A MAC address is the unique hardware address of an Ethernet NIC typically burned in at the factory. MAC addresses may be changed in software. Historically, MAC addresses were 48 bits long. The first 24 bits form the organizationally unique identifier, also known as the OUI, and the last 24 bits form a serial number formerly called an extension identifier. The IEEE created the EUI64, also known as the Extended Unique Identifier, for standard 64-bit MAC addresses. The OUI is still 24 bits, but the serial number is 40 bits. This allows for far more MAC addresses compared to the 48-bit addresses. IP version 6 auto configuration is compatible with both these types of MAC addresses. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, transfers unencrypted web-based data. HTTPS, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, transfers encrypted web-based data via SSL TLS. HTTP uses TCP port 80, and HTTPS uses TCP port 443. HTML, or Hypertext Markup Language, is used to display web content. The host-to-host -host transport layer, or more commonly called simply the transport layer, connects the internet layer to the application layer. It is where applications are addressed on a network via ports. TCP and UDP are the two transport layer protocols used in TCP IP. A bus network topology connects each system to a trunk or backbone cable. All systems on the bus can transmit data simultaneously, which can result in collisions. A collision occurs when two systems transmit data at the same time. The signals interfere with each other. Ethernet is an example of a bus network. The TCP IP application layer combines the session, presentation, and application layers of the OSI model. Most of these protocols use a client-server architecture where a client connects to a listening server, such as SSHD. The clients and servers use either TCP or UDP, or sometimes both as a transport layer protocol. TCP IP application layer protocols include Secure Shell, Telnet, FTP, and many others. SMTP is the simple mail transfer protocol, which is used to transfer email between servers. SMTP servers listen on TCP port 25. PLP version 3, also known as Post Office Protocol, and IMAP, also known as Internet Message Access Protocol, are used for client-server email access, which use TCP ports 110 and 143, respectively. So next, let's go over standard network topologies. A star network topology employs a centralized connection device. It can simply be a hub or switch. Each system is connected to the central hub by a dedicated segment. A mesh network topology connects systems to all other systems using numerous paths. A partial mesh topology connects many systems to many other systems. A mesh network topology provides redundant connections to systems, allowing multiple segment failures without seriously affecting connectivity. A ring network topology connects each system as points on a circle. The connection medium acts as a unidirectional transmission loop. Only one system can transmit data at a time. Traffic management is performed by a token. A multitude of protocols exist at the TCP IP application layer, which combines the session, presentation, and application layers of the OSI model. The OSI model, or the Open Systems Interconnection model, is a conceptual framework used to describe the functions of a networking system. 
The OSI model characterizes computing functions into a universal set of rules and requirements in order to support interoperability between different products and the software. In the OSI reference model, the communications between a computer system are split into seven different abstraction layers. These layers include the physical layer, the data link layer, the network layer, the transport layer, the session layer, the presentation layer, and the application layer. The OSI model was created at a time when network computing was in its infancy. It was published in 1984 by the ISO, and though it does not always map directly to specific systems, the OSI model is still used to this day as means to describe network architecture. So the first layer we'll look at is the physical layer. The physical layer is the lowest layer of the OSI model, and it is concerned with electrically and optically transmitting raw and structured data bits across the network from the physical layer of the sending device to the physical layer of the receiving device. It can include specifications such as voltages, pin layout, cabling, and radio frequencies. At the physical layer, one might find physical resources such as network hubs, cabling, repeaters, network adapters, or modems. The second layer of the OSI model is the data link layer. At the data link layer, directly connected nodes are used to perform node-to-node -node data transfer where the data is packaged into frames. The data link layer also corrects errors that may have occurred at the physical layer. The data link layer encompasses two sub-layers on its own. The first, a media access control, also known as MAC address, provides flow control and multiplexing for device transmissions over a network. The second, the logical link control, also known as LOC, provides flow and air control over the physical medium as well as the identifies line protocols. The third layer of the OSI model is the network layer. The network layer is responsible for receiving frames from the data link layer and delivering them to their intended destinations based on the addresses contained inside the frame. The network layer finds the destination by using logical addresses such as IP addresses or internet protocol. At this layer, routers are crucial components used to quite literally route information from where it needs to go between networks. The fourth layer of the OSI model is the transport layer. The transport layer manages the delivery and error checking of data packets. It regulates the size, sequencing, and ultimately the transfer of data between systems and hosts. One of the most common examples of the transport layer is TCP, or the Transmission Control Protocol. The fifth layer of the OSI model is the session layer. The session layer controls the conversations between different computers. A session or connection between machines is set up and managed at layer 5. Session layers services also include authentication and reconnections. The sixth layer is the presentation layer. The presentation layer formats or translates data for the application layer based on syntax or semantics that the application accepts. Because of this, it is at times also called the syntax layer. This layer can also handle the encryption and decryption required by the application layer. The seventh layer is the application layer. At this layer, both the end user and the application layer interact directly with the software application. This layer sees network services provided to end user applications such as web browsers or Office 365. The application layer identifies communication partners, resource availability, and synchronizes communication. So next, let's look at common network devices. Network devices include firewalls, switches, routers, and gateways. Firewalls are essential tools in managing and controlling traffic. A firewall is a network device used to filter traffic. Switches repeat traffic only out of the port at which the destination is known to exist. Switches offer greatest efficiency for traffic delivery, create separate collision domains, and improve the overall throughput of data. They usually occur on the OSI model later too. Routers are used to control traffic flow on networks and are often used to connect similar networks and traffic flow between the two. 
They can function using statically defined routing tables, or they can employ a dynamic routing system. They occur on layer three. A gateway connects networks that are used differently for network protocols. They're also known as protocol translators. Can be standalone hardware devices or a software device. Network gateways also work at layer three. Some other common network devices are repeaters, concentrators, amplifiers, bridges, hubs, and LAN extenders. Repeaters, concentrators, and amplifiers are used to strengthen the communication signal over a cable segment as well as connect network segments that use the same protocol. These all take place at layer one. Bridges are used to connect two networks, even networks of different topologies, cabling types, and speeds in order to connect network segments that use the same protocol. Bridges take place at layer two. Hubs were used to connect multiple systems and connect network segments that use the same protocol. A hub is a multi-port repeater. Hubs operate at OSI layer one. The LAN extenders are a remote access multi-layer switch used to connect distant networks over a WAN link. Network devices include LAN and WAN technologies, also known as local area network technologies and wide area network technologies. WAN connections and communication links can include private circuit technologies and packet switching technologies. Private circuit technologies use dedicated physical circuits. Private circuit technologies also use dedicated or lease lines, PPP or point-to-point -point protocol, SLIP or serial line internet protocol, ISDN or integrated services digital network, and DSL, which stands for digital subscriber line. Packet switching technologies use virtual circuits instead of dedicated physical circuits. This is more efficient and cost effective. Packet switching technologies include X.25 frame relay, asynchronous transfer mode, also known as ATM, synchronous data link control, also known as SDLC, and high level data link control, also known as HDLC. So next, let's go over the types of firewalls. These include static packet filtering firewalls, application level gateway firewalls, and circuit level gateway firewalls. Static packet filtering firewalls filter traffic by examining data from a message header. Application level gateway firewalls use a mechanism that copies packets from one network into another. They then change the source and destination addresses to protect identity of internal or private networks. Circuit level gateway firewalls are used to establish communication sessions between trusted partners. They operate at the session layer or layer five of the OSI model. Some other types of firewalls include stateful inspection firewalls, deep packet inspection firewalls, and next generation firewalls. Stateful inspection firewalls evaluate the state or the context of network traffic. Deep packet inspection firewalls use a filtering mechanism that operates typically at the application layer in order to filter the payload contents of a communication rather than only on the header values. Next generation firewalls is a multifunction device composed of several security features in addition to a firewall. These include IDS, IPS, TLS, SSL proxies, web filtering, QoS, MGMT, bandwidth throttling, NAT, VPN anchoring, and antiviruses. Next, let's talk the difference between stateless and stateful firewalls. Stateless firewalls watch network traffic and restrict or block packets based on source and destination addresses or other static values. They are not aware of traffic patterns or data flows. They also typically are faster and perform better under heavier traffic loads. Stateful firewalls can watch traffic streams from end to end. They are aware of communication paths and can implement various IP security functions such as tunnels and encryption. They are also better at identifying unauthorized and or forged communications. Next, let's talk intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. 
intrusion detection systems analyze whole packets, both header and payload, looking for known events. When a known event is detected, a log message is generated. Intrusion prevention systems analyze whole packets, both header and payload, looking for known events. When a known event is detected, packets are rejected. Next, let's go over the types of IDS systems. These include behavior-based and knowledge-based. Behavior-based creates a baseline of activity to identify normal behavior and then measures system performance against the baseline to detect abnormal behavior. This type of IDS system can detect previously unknown attack methods. Knowledge base uses signatures similar to the signature definitions used by anti-malware software. It is only effective against known attack methods. Both host-based and network-based systems can be knowledge-based, behavior-based, or a combination of both. So the first network attacks we'll go over are denial of service and distributed denial of service. A denial of service attack floods a server with traffic, making a website or resource unavailable. A distributed denial of service attack is a denial of service attack that uses multiple computers or machines to flood a targeted resource. Both types of attacks overload a server or web application with the main goal of interrupting services. The principal difference between DOS and DDOS is that the former is a system-on-system -system attack, while the latter involves several systems attacking a single system. There are five main differences between DOS and DDOS attacks. One, ease of detection. Two, speed of attack. Three, traffic volume. Four, manner of execution. And five, tracing of source. With ease of detection, since a DOS comes from a single location, it is easier to detect its origin and sever the connection. In fact, a proficient firewall can do this. On the other hand, a DDoS attack comes from multiple remote locations, disguising its origin. With the speed of attack, because a DDoS comes from multiple locations, it can be deployed much faster than a DOS attack that originates from one. The increased speed of attack makes detecting it more difficult, meaning increased damage or even catastrophic outcome. With traffic volume, a DDoS attack employs multiple remote machines, which means it can send much larger amounts of traffic from various locations simultaneously. This overloads the server rapidly in a manner that eludes detection. With manner of execution, a DDoS attack coordinates multiple hosts infected with malware, creating a botnet managed by a command and control server. In contrast, a DOS attack typically uses a script or a tool to carry out an attack from a single machine. And lastly, with tracing a source, the use of a botnet in a DDoS attack means the tracing the actual origin is much more complicated than tracing the origin of a DOS attack. Countermeasures for DOS and DDoS attacks include firewalls, routers, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, disabling broadcast packets from entering and leaving, and disabling echo replies. Botnets, controllers, and bot herders represent significant threats due to the massive number of computers that can launch attacks. Botnets are a collection of compromised computing devices, often called bots or zombies. Bot herders are criminals who use the command and control server to remotely control the zombies, often use the botnet to launch attacks on other systems or to send spam or phishing emails. Denial of service attacks can take many forms and be used for various means. It can be to make a company lose business, to cripple a competitor, to distract from other attacks, or simply to cause trouble or make a statement. Denial of service attacks prevent a system from responding to legitimate questions for service. Common denial of service attacks include SIN flood attack, smurf attack, and ping of death attack. SIN flood attacks disrupt the TCP three-way handshake. Smurf attacks employ an amplification network to send numerous response packets to a victim. And ping of death attacks 
send numerous oversized pink packets to the victim, causing the victim to freeze, crash, or reboot. Some more common types of denial of service attacks. So when dealing with network attacks, it is very, very important to know the order of the three-way handshake. It comes up commonly in discussions of TCP IP based network attacks. For example, the SIN flood attack exploits the TCP three-way handshake as follows. The attacker floods a victim site with SIN packets. The victim then responds to each SIN packet with a SIN ACT packet. The attacker does not respond with the last portion of the handshake and act packet, leaving the victim waiting for a response. Then the attacker continues to send the victim SIN frames with the spoofed address. The victim then continues to attempt sessions with the attacker allocating resources to accommodate each of these inbound session requests. So many resources are allocated that the victim cannot process a legitimate inbound request for a TCP IP session. Another type of network attack is called eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is simply listening to communication traffic for the purpose of duplicating it and or extracting confidential information. It's difficult to detect because it's a passive attack. Some countermeasures for this is to maintain physical access security, encryption in transit, and one-time authentication methods. Another type of network attack is impersonation or masquerading. This is the act of pretending to be someone or something you are not to gain unauthorized access to a network or system. Impersonation attacks also usually imply that authentication credentials have been stolen or falsified in order to bypass authentication mechanisms. Some countermeasures to stop this attack are one-time pads, token authentication systems, encrypting traffic, and employee awareness training. Some other type of network attacks are DNS attacks. DNS attacks include DNS poisoning and DNS spoofing. DNS poisoning is when an attacker alters the domain name to IP address mappings in a DNS system. They may redirect traffic to a rogue system or perform denial of service against that system. DNS spoofing is when an attacker sends false replies to a requesting system, beating the real reply from a valid DNS server. Some countermeasures for these attacks include allow only authorized changes to the DNS, restrict zone transfers, verify forwarders, and all log privileged DNS activities. Another type of DNS attack is a homograph attack. A homograph attack leverages similarities in character sets to register phony international domain names, also called IDNs, that appear legitimate to the naked eye. A way to mitigate this risk is to update your browser regularly. Also on the client side, modern browsers that use Punicode can stop it. On the server side, use policies implemented by ICANN. Another form of a network attack is hyperlink spoofing. Hyperlink spoofing is very similar to DNS spoofing, 
It can take the form of DNS spoofing or just simply be an alteration of the hyperlink URLs. It's usually successful because people just Okay, let's talk about Windows. So here we are in a terminal. Inside the terminal window, we see a little message here, and another message here, and a cursor. Now this message is the shell prompt. It usually displays some information about the computer you're logged into. Exactly what message you see here will depend on your system. Later on, we'll see how to change it. If you type something in at the shell prompt and press enter, the shell will try to run whatever you typed as a command. Throughout this course, you'll be learning a bunch of shell commands. Here's the first one. The echo command is how we get the shell to print messages back to us. It's like console.log in JavaScript, or print in Python. Try it out. OK, what happens if I want the greeting to be a little bit more enthusiastic? Hello, shello, followed by two exclamation marks. Huh, that's weird. Hello, shello, echo, hello, shello. Hello, shello, echo, hello, shello. Hey, if I said that a bunch of times in a row, that could be a number one jam. <laughs> hello, shello, echo, hello, shello, hello, shello, echo, hello, shello. The point being, there are some characters that have a special meaning to the shell. The exclamation mark is one of them. 
If you're ever typing something into the shell and it seems to be treating what you're saying in a weird way, all you usually need to do is to put single quotes around it. Ah, there we go. That's a little bit less repetitive. You've seen how many shells you've had. 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 You've seen how
Microsoft Azure is a private and public cloud platform. You may be familiar with the Azure services that developers and IT professionals use to build, deploy, and manage applications. But how does it work? Azure uses a technology known as virtualization. Virtualization separates the tight coupling between a computer's CPU and its operating system using an abstraction layer called a hypervisor. The hypervisor emulates all the functions of a real computer and its CPU in a virtual machine. It can run multiple virtual machines at the same time. And each virtual machine can run any compatible operating system, such as Windows or Linux. Azure takes this virtualization technology and repeats it on a massive scale in Microsoft data centers throughout the world. Each data center has many racks filled with servers each server includes a hypervisor to run multiple virtual machines. A network switch provides connectivity to the servers. One server in each rack runs a special piece of software called a fabric controller. Each fabric controller is connected to another special piece of software known as the orchestrator. The orchestrator is responsible for managing everything that happens in Azure, including responding to user requests. Users make requests using the orchestrator's web API. The web API can be called by many tools, including the user interface of the Azure portal. When a user makes a request to create a virtual machine, the orchestrator packages everything that's needed, picks the best server rack, then sends the package and request to the fabric controller. Once the fabric controller has created the virtual machine, the user can connect to it. Azure makes it easy for developers and IT professionals to be agile when they build, deploy, and manage their applications and services. But this agility can have unintended consequences if unauthorized resources are created or if resources are left running after they're no longer needed. The solution to this problem is to use Azure's resource access management tools as part of your organization's governance program. That's the subject of the next video in the series. Let's get started. I'll start the module by talking about the importance of securing your communication. We'll see why it is important not to send unencrypted information between clients and the application sitting on the server. After that, we will see how we can secure these communications. SSL and the successor TLS are used to secure communications between different machines. We will see how SSL works. At this point in the module, you'll have a good understanding about SSL and TLS. Now it's time to see how Azure leverages these technologies to provide more secure communications. Azure is already using TLS to secure communication to storage accounts, databases, and RESTful APIs. We are going to review a few services which are already leveraged by TLS. For most of these services, for example, storage accounts, you don't need to do any configuration to enable TLS. TLS is already enabled as soon as you start using your storage account. Same goes for many databases and RESTful APIs. We're going to take a closer look into app services and how securing them using TLS. We will discuss two scenarios regarding app services. The first one is using the default Azure URL to access your app services. And the second scenario, when you have a custom domain and you want to use it with the website hosted on your app service. 
Okay, before moving on to Azure, let's talk about SSL and TLS in general. There are many communications that you might want to secure. It could be a client browser accessing your website, or it could be a function app querying SQL database to get some data back. So just imagine the communication between these entities are not encrypted, so you are sending your payload in plain text. These payloads can contain passwords, credit card numbers, social security numbers, and other important information. So someone monitoring the communication line can read the packages and extract the payload from them. If the payloads are not encrypted, they'll have access to all your sensitive information. So let's see how we can protect our data. Imagine the client is encrypting the request before sending it to the server side, so the payload won't be in plain format. It will be encrypted. The server has access to the same key the client used in the encryption, so it can go ahead and decrypt the request to process it. On the other hand, when the server is ready to return the response to the client, it is going to encrypt it using the same key and send it to the client. The client will then decrypt the response and use it. So again, in this scenario, if someone monitors the line, they can still access our packages and extract the payload. However, they cannot get any useful information from the payload because we don't give them access to the encryption keys. So this process is implemented using SSL and its successor, TLS. So SSL and its successor, TLS, are protocols which are used to secure communication between different machines. Imagine you have a client browser and your website is hosted on an app service in Azure. You go ahead and purchase an SSL certificate and configure your app service to use this certificate. Any SSL certificate consists of two keys, a private key and a public key. The private key never leaves the server and it always stays on the certificate owner's machine. The public key portion of the certificate will then be sent to any client who wishes to communicate to the server and the client is going to use the public key to encrypt this request. So any data encrypted by the public key can be decrypted by the private key. Also, any data encrypted by the private key can be decrypted by the public key. Having said that, the server is going to take the encrypted request and decrypt it using the private key. It processes the request, generates a response, and encrypts the response using the private key and sends it back to the client. And as mentioned before, the client is going to use the public key to decrypt the return response to the server. TLS, which is the newer version of SSL, provides privacy and data integrity between communicating applications by encrypting the payload. The public key is packaged into SSL certificate and shared with the client, for example, web browsers or any other client who wishes to communicate securely with the server. The private key never leaves the server and is used to encrypt and decrypt the payload. It's important to note that SSL protocol is depreciated. The transport layer, or TLS, has been replaced, but for some reason, these two terms are used interchangeably. So throughout this course, we're going to talk about TLS. SSL is depreciated, so there is one important question. How a service provider or client can trust the certificate they purchase? TLS certificates can be purchased from trusted authorities. They establish the authenticity of certificates. When you buy the certificate, the certificate is signed by one of the trusted authorities. This way, the client and server know that the certificate is safe to use. Before moving on to Azure, let's briefly talk about SSL and TLS versions. SSL version 1 was internally released before 1995, but was never released publicly because of serious security issues. SSL version 2 was publicly released in 1995. It was a good start, but it had a few security issues which led to the SSL version 3.0 in 1996. TLS version 1.0 was an upgrade from SSL version 3.0, and it was released in 1999. TLS version 1.1 was released in 2006 to address major security issues in TLS 1.0. TLS version 1.2 was released in 2008, and it is the default version of TLS for any app service you create after June 30th, 2018. You still will have the option to tweak TLS version to 1.1 or even 1.0 in Azure App Service SSL configuration page, but it is not recommended to go below TLS 1.1.
Finally, the TLS 1.3 was released in 2018. TLS is the main protocol used by Azure to secure communications between different services and machines. Several services in Azure are already using TLS. For example, function apps are using SSL to secure default URL for the function app. If you want to assign custom domain for your function app, you need to purchase and configure a custom SSL certificate. Azure Storage is using TLS by default. For example, each time you're using a blob storage, a communication is protected using TLS. Azure Cache is also using TLS to secure the communication. If you are using the default Azure address to access your app service, that communication is already encrypted using TLS. Later in the module, we will talk about using custom domains with app services and how to purchase and configure a custom SSL certificate to protect your app service with custom domains. Azure Key Vault is a service which is already protected using TLS. And finally, Azure SQL database can be used to configure SSL to secure communications. And as I mentioned, these are only samples. Almost all communications in Azure are protected or can be protected by TLS. The focus for the rest of this module is on app services to protect the communication using SSL. Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure is an extension of HTTP. It is used to secure communications over a computer network. And as you can guess, in HTTPS, the communication is encrypted using TLS. All communications to Azure app services can be secured using TLS. This is true for other types of app services, including function apps. Let's see how it works. Most of us have worked with app services. So if you navigate to the overview page of your app service, you can examine the URL by which the app service is accessible. There are two types of URLs for your app service. Learn about Azure security best practices in this episode of Azure Tips and Tricks. In this video, we'll go over seven Azure security best practices. The first one is encrypt data at rest and in flight. If an attacker gains access to your database, let's say an Azure SQL database, you can still protect your data. It is protected by the transparent data encryption feature or TDE, which is enabled by default. Azure manages the encryption keys and you can also bring your own. This feature is available in Azure SQL and Azure Synapse Analytics. And a similar feature is enabled in Azure Database for Postgres SQL and for Azure Database for MySQL. You should also make sure that data that travels over the wire, in-flight data, is secured. You secure this with TLS or Transport Layer Security. For most services, secure data transport is enabled by default, or you can enable it yourself. The best practices to remember are always encrypt data at rest and always encrypt in-flight data. The next best practice is restrict access to your database. You only want people and services that you choose to access your database. In all Azure databases, you can configure the firewall, which is enabled by default and blocks IP addresses that are not allowed. This is great for development and testing. And for production, you can wrap your database in a virtual network and use Azure Private Link to connect to it from the services that you need to. This shields your database from the outside world. The best practices to remember are enable database firewalls and maintain them strictly, and in production, shield databases from the outside world using Azure Private Link. The next best practice is restrict access to your VMs. If you are using a virtual machine in Azure, you probably want to use RDP or SSH to connect to it. Opening the RDP or SSH port creates a security vulnerability. So you should leave these ports closed when you create a VM. Instead, you can deploy your VM in a virtual network and use Azure Bastion to securely connect to it. When you use Azure Bastion, your VM doesn't need a public IP address, which shields it from the outside world. The best practices to remember are keep the RDP and SSH port of your VMs disabled and use Azure Bastion to connect to your VMs. Next up is protect your application secrets. You shouldn't store secrets like API keys and connection strings in application code where every developer can see them. 
you should store them in a central place, in Azure, that is Azure Key Vault. This contains the secrets, keys and certificates for your applications. And you can securely connect to Azure Key Vault from your services using Azure Managed Service Identity. This allows you to connect to Key Vault without using an API key or connection string. The best practices to remember are store application secrets in a central place like Azure Key Vault and use a built-in mechanism like managed service identities to connect to Azure Key Vault. Next is use a separate Azure subscription for production. For production environments, the best practice is to create a separate Azure subscription. This helps you to keep your production data and other assets out of your dev test environments. And you can also easily apply two different sets of policies across the resources in the two subscriptions. Also, you should use role-based access control or Airbag to control which people have access to which resources. You can apply Airbag to all Azure resources, including resource groups and subscriptions. The best practices to remember are implement role-based access control and use a separate Azure subscription for production. The next best practice is implement a web application firewall. Your web applications are under constant attack. They get hit by things like SQL injection attacks and cross-site scripting attacks. To deal with these attacks, you should implement a gateway service like Azure Front Door or Application Gateway that can route and filter your traffic. And in these services, you should enable the Web Application Firewall feature. This detects attacks and can block and report them. The best practices to remember are implement a gateway service like Azure Application Gateway or Azure Front Door in front of your web applications and enable the Web Application Firewall feature to protect you against attacks. The final best practice is use Azure Security Center. If there is only one best practice that you adopt from this video, it should be this one. Use Azure Security Center. This is an Azure service that tells you what your security state is, what you can improve and how to do that. You can use Azure Security Center to periodically check the security of your resources and to be alerted when something needs your attention. Security Center helps you to implement security best practices by telling you where they need to be implemented and allows you to directly implement them from the Security Center. The best practice to remember is use Azure Security Center. Security is a complex topic. A great way to get started with it in Azure is to use Azure Security Center. Stay safe.